Hello, everyone. Um, I want to talk today about uh, the history of art, web design, and CSS development. That's uh, huge topics. Um, so I will start right away. And I want to introduce you to two different, very different artists. First one here is uh, Jackson Pollock. Um, he was very active in the 1940s and 50s. And uh, he, uh, he received a photograph of him, and he liked to stage himself as an actor. He always uh, was uh, shown like this. Um, because in the 40s, it was a little bit hard for men to be an artist and still keep the masculinity. At least this is what they thought uh, it was. Um, so this was his way of doing this, uh, looking uh, uh, like a James Dean lookalike. And uh, well, in the end, um, he died like uh, James Dean driving his car into a tree. Um, so uh, at least some similarities. But I don't want to talk about this today. Uh, I want to talk about his art. And his art looks like this. Uh, this one here, uh, this piece of art is called Autumn Rhythm Number no. Thirty. It's from uh, the nineteen, it's from nineteen fifty, and it is quite huge. It's uh, more than five meters in the width and uh, above two and a half meters in the height. And what Jackson Pollock did uh, is was very different to what other artists did because he had the canvas on the floor and then he was. Uh, walking around it and dripping paint onto the canvas. And he was using sticks mostly to uh, put it on the canvas, but sometimes was also pouring the paint right out of uh, the can onto the canvas. Um, and he was doing this while walking around it, walking on the canvas, uh, and it looks like a, some kind of performance, some kind of dance or something. And People are always referring to it as he's picking up vibes from the landscape around him. So he's taking up where he's living, looking at the vast landscape that surrounds him, and then takes this and creates some art from it. Uh, he described his work as gardening the image. And you see there's a lot of feeling, a lot of emotion, taking up vibes uh, going on here. Uh, sometimes he says he needs to have a connection to the art and he's losing the connection sometimes, then he puts it away and starts a new one. So uh, it's all about expressing energy and inner forces and uh, putting this uh, into some piece of art. Um, and most of his uh, works look like this. Uh, this is another one. This one here is called Blue Poles. It's from 1952. Uh, quite interesting for this piece here is an uh, interesting fact that it was sold for $2 million in 1973. Um, and this was quite unique at this time. It, it was okay to, to um, buy a piece of art for this price if it was something like Rembrandt or something like that. But it was quite new for a modern piece of art. And uh, the people, uh, it was for an Australian um, museum. Uh, they were, people were saying, okay, this is what are you doing with our tax uh, money? You shouldn't pay that much for just splashes. But well, nowadays, uh, this is quite normal to do things like that also for modern art. And here you can see him working. You see he's standing on his final artwork and then doing all the dripping and stuff and uh, very ac action painting style. Sometimes he's also called uh, Jack the Dripper. So that's him. That's the first artist I want to talk about today. And the second one is much older. It's uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, and he's uh, from 1377. And normally you shouldn't do something like this, comparing artists uh, from uh, that are so different. But since this is a CSS conference, I think I can get away with it. And uh, Brunelleschi is famous for building the dome in Florence. Um, and you can see he's quite proud of it, so he holds it in his hand. But he's also famous for uh, teaching us how to do, uh, to draw with a constructed linear perspective. So Brunelleschi is the one uh, that taught us that if you want to translate uh, the three-dimensional world that we are living in onto a two-dimensional canvas, it mustn't look like this, uh, but instead it should look much more like this or depending on your taste in 90s games, maybe like this. Because this way of drawing was so new to the people, he had to convince them that this is the right way of doing it. And he did this by doing some experiments. And uh, 
the first experiment there, um, he stood uh, again in Florence in front of the baptistry. And uh, from this building, he did uh, a painting and uh, he had this octagonal building in front of him and he was able to mathematically calculate the scale of objects within the painting in order to make it appear realistic. Um, as you can see, vanishing points, maybe you've done something like this in school or something. And this is what he did, uh, constructed very mathematically. And then um, he took some people and placed them um, there where you can see the red dot in front of the dome. Um, and they looked onto the baptistry that was in front of them. Um, so here and looking at the baptistry. And then he showed them his painting, but he didn't make you look at the painting directly, but instead he made a little hole into the painting and you had to look through the painting, holding it facing away from you. And when you looked through the painting, through this hole, you looked onto the baptistry, the real one. And then he held up a little mirror and the mirror was showing um, the painting that he made in the end. So you could hold up the mirror and compare this to the real building and uh, this is how he convinced people that this constructed way of uh, painting is the right way to do it. Unfortunately, this original, uh, orig original panel has been lost, but we have something else. So after he's done all his uh, theory, he uh, told his buddy uh, Masaccio about it. And Masaccio then uh, took this knowledge and painted this painting here. It's called uh, the Holy Trinity. And uh, what you can see here is uh, the godfather um, as an old man with a beard holding his son, Jesus, uh, on the cross. And uh, the thing that looks like a little fancy necklace, the white thing there, uh, that is a dove, that's the Holy Spirit. And this fresco, uh, it's quite huge, um, is the first painting uh, that we uh, have uh, that used uh, constructed linear perspective. And because it's quite huge, uh, the vanishing point is very low. It's somewhere down here. And you can see that in the ceiling and also uh, down there where the skeleton is lying, all the points are pointing to this one vanishing point. And uh, here you can see how it looks in the Santa Maria Novella in Florence. Uh, this is where this uh, fresco can be seen even today. And please, don't ask me why it's not centered under the window. I have no idea. So uh, we're having these two artists. Um, I'll make them I'll make them look at each other uh, so they get to know each other. Uh, and I could have used other people here as well. Uh, for the uh, artists that uses a lot of emotions, um, I could have used maybe um, Monet here, uh, very interested in light and shadows. And uh, maybe you remember Adam, shadows are always tinted. You can see this over here in the cathedral. Um, I could have used an expressionist as well, of course, uh, Munch here. And uh, remember when I said um, Pollock is taking up vibes from uh, around him, these vibes can also be political vibes or uh, what, uh, what's going on in society right, on, uh, right now. And if you have something like this, uh, an artist like Banksy would be a great example here. On the other hand, uh, we have um, someone like uh, the mathematical artists. Uh, I could have used uh, Leonardo da Vinci and his work. Um, or if you go a little bit closer to the present, um, I could have uh, had MC Escher as an uh, example, or um, the artist Kos Verhoof, who's done um, uh, sculptures from fractals. So these are now two very different types of artists. And now I want you to imagine what would it look like if these artists were not artists in their time, but today's um, web designers. So uh, we have, they were, they are web designers today. And what would their work look like? And we start with uh, Jackson Pollock here. And maybe he was doing a lot of mood boards maybe. And then he was looking at tons of images to just find the perfect uh, photograph for his current project that uh, transfers the message that he wants to deliver. And once he's found it, he will tweak 
uh, the colors will do a, a little bit more contrast here and so that it fits the brand and the message and everything will be um, perfect in the end. On the other hand, um, Filippo Bonaleschi will maybe deliver you a perfectly named neat uh, design um, system. Um, of course, uh, you will have a, a modular scale for all the topography, uh, perfect uh, grid system, and also uh, nicely named colors that are, of course, uh, accessible because uh, he will have listened to Gemma's talk earlier and will uh, take all this uh, in and use this in his next work. The project itself that they are working on might be uh, might look like this for Jackson, like a marketing landing page or something like this, whereas um, Brunelleschi might be working on uh, application design uh, like this here. Now, think of these two artists and uh, what would happen if you gave both of them the task of designing a headline with two paragraphs and a link in it. So we just have a headline, two paragraphs and a link in this. And we will start with Brunelleschi. He's giving this task and said, okay, that's uh, easy. Um, here you go, this is your result. We have this headline, then two paragraphs, and there's the blue underlined link. Now a new person is coming uh, on the, to the game. Um, our little developer here, and I will call her Getty for no special reason. And uh, she's uh, using the, uh, de uh, the design tool, uh, inspect uh, tool, and uh, looks at uh, the headline and what she's seeing here. I hope you can see this on the screen. Um, she sees that there is a um, text style that is named text for XL. The font size for the text is 40 pixels. The line height is 44 pixels. And the color is also named. It also has a variable, it's named black. And she's really happy because she can use this and translate this to some um, HTML that probably looks uh, like this. And uh, she will add some, some classes here. The text for XL, these are Tailwind classes. Um, this one will uh, will be used to set the font size. The text black is for the color, so she will have this color here. And font black is for the font weight black. This is the 900 over here. And she could use also uh, utility classes to do all the margins, but she decides to do this with the news class here and apply some uh, margins uh, with a style sheet or something that she adds here. And I guess knowing Brunelleschi, I think he knows some CSS as well. So maybe he has do the uh, has made the pre configuration for the Tailwind classes uh, himself. So that all uh, Getty here has to do is um, copy and paste things and putting this together um, to build uh, the application. And they get along very well, and uh, they are happy together. Now, let's see what uh, Jackson has in stock for us. He got the same task, okay, do a headline and two paragraphs and a link in this. And he says, okay, yeah, he uh, starts working. And after some time, he presents you with uh, this one here. So same task, but quite different result. And again, Getty comes and starts uh, looking uh, onto uh, on this layout and looking at the headline. And here she sees, well, there's, there's no text style. The font size is 158.91 uh, pixels. Okay, that's strange. Line height is 160.5. Okay, uh, strange as well. The color doesn't have a name. It's HSLA 330 uh, for the hue. Is that black or I, I don't know. So she's a little confused. Um, and she goes over to, uh, to Jackson and says, okay, Jackson, uh, we need to talk because this just looks awesome. I wanna do this and I wanna make this work. It will be maybe a little bit, oh, will be a tough one, but we can make this work. And I wanna show you how her process of uh, uh, dealing with this layout uh, looks like. And she looks at this thing and because Jackson is an artist, um, she 
tries to treat this whole thing as if it was a piece of art. And she looks at what makes this uh, uh, piece of art so uh, unique, what, what makes it special. And first thing that comes to mind is uh, the very huge headline we're having here. I mean, look at this headline. This is, uh, it's not about accessibility, readability here anymore. Jackson just wants it to scream at you and it's kind of a substitute for an image because he was told to not use an image, just a headline. So he had nothing else. So he used the headline to make it stand out. So it's really huge. And okay, Getty looking at this said, it was roughly 160 pixels in size and the line height was also 160 roughly. But instead of using these 160 pixels, she uh, decides to use um, uh, another font size. She uses uh, viewport units. So she calculates one EM plus 10 VW, so the viewport width. Um, so the font always stays as big as possible, kind of. Uh, the one EM is in there to make sure it doesn't get too small. So that's the first thing she does for the headline and she's quite happy with it. Now, next thing she looks at uh, the paragraph again. It had a, just not at the position, just on the width and it has nice line length here. And I uh, hope you can read this. Underneath here, it says 720 pixels. But maybe she will use some viewport width uh, units to scale the text here as well. So the 720 will have to change maybe. So instead of using this, she says, okay, I wanna, uh, I'm, I'm drawing zeros underneath it and counting them. And she does this because she wants to use the CH unit. CH is a unit that uh, is the width of the font size, uh, of, the, of the font in the given font size and font family. So she can use uh, a max width of 50 CH for the paragraphs. Um, so even if the font size or the font family will change, um, it will always have the same line length of roughly 50 characters. Now, the final thing that she needs to address here is um, the columns and, and the layout itself. And she says, okay, Jackson, what have you done here? Because normally what you would do is you, you'd have a container and this container gets a max width and then you do some margin left auto, margin right auto, Nowadays, you could do margin inline auto, so the can, uh, container is centered. That's not possible here because we have 230 pixels on the left and 114 on the right. So what do we have or what can we do here? So she again tries to see, okay, what's maybe the ratio between all of these numbers here? And she says, okay, over here, we are having 114 pixels. And if I, if I double this, I get roughly, these 230 over here. And this multiplied by three is roughly 344 that we are having over here. So we can say that here's one third, two thirds on the left and three thirds in the second column. And what's also interesting here is that most of these columns here are filled with white space. There is this headline going up here, but the rest is just white space. And distributing white space is something that you can do really good uh, using CSS Grid. And uh, this looks like this. So she uses a container, names this uh, fancy text, and then she has a display grid. And she uses grid template columns, 2FR, 3FR, auto, and 1FR. And these FR, the fraction unit, uh, stand for, so if there's space available, then uh, divide it like this, put one unit to the right, two units to the left, and uh, three units in the second column. And the last thing she needs to do is uh, put uh, the uh, elements onto the script, so the headline starting in the second column, ending in the fourth line, and the paragraphs starting, in the, uh, starting and ending in the third column, so third line and fourth line is where it starts and ends. Putting this all together, uh, the CSS looks like this. I don't know if you can read this here, but it's just a, a combination of this all. For the fancy text, we have uh, uh, the grid stuff. I also added a little bit of margin that has uh, some vertical viewport units uh, in this as well. Uh, that's uh, going on here. 
the font size for, for the headline and the rest is just line height, a little bit of margin, uh, the black font weight and the grid column over here. Um, the paragraph, as I said before, has a tiny bit of viewport unit in the size here as well, but not as much as uh, the headline has. Just, it's just a tiny bit, so it will grow and shrink, um, but not as much as the headline. Line height here uh, without any uh, unit is set to 1.5. Uh, we have a little bit of margin, we have the grid column, and of course, uh, what I told uh, about uh, you about before is the max width of 50 characters. What we have here is a responsive layout without the use of any media query, and it uh, looks in the end like this. So if you scale this, you can see that it always looks nice. And what's really important here is that um, she tried to, and I think she succeeded in preserving the intention of the artist. So as soon as uh, uh, there's enough space, the paragraph is indented, the headline is always really huge. And uh, here uh, is another example where you can see how the columns um, behave with the uh, different uh, width that they are given through the grid. And all of this is uh, possible because at this point here, uh, she did decided to put some more work in this. It could have been quite differently from here. She could have said, Okay, Jackson, I think you don't really understand the medium. This is not how, how the internet works, but don't worry. I did a little Google search and here you find a Figma template uh, with a lot of Tailwind components. And uh, you know, uh, the developer experience is much better if you just stick to this and uh, use uh, these components only and then everyone will be happy, right? And I guess after a while working with it, maybe Jackson would have been first angry and later sad. And uh, well, we don't want him to be sad, do we? Um, but fortunately, uh, Getty saw the value in his work and invested a little bit more time in this problem and created something um, that suits uh, the needs uh, of what Jackson wanted to have here. Finally, in conclusion, I would like to uh, discuss the relationships and uh, job titles also of the individual protagonists that we have met today. Um, and for this, I wanna introduce another developer here. I guess her name will be Getty as well. And um, uh, where we've seen the first Getty is kind of a CSS master here. And the second one, she does more of a JavaScript developer doing more application development and stuff like this. And Within these two, there's been a discourse for some time now. Uh, it can be named uh, The Great Divide after the famous article that, that Chris Coya wrote. And it's all about the question, uh, what, is, uh, what makes a front-end developer or a full-stack developer and do we need this? And over time, uh, uh, all the roles became a little bit more specific. We were, we were starting to talk about front of the front-end developer and back of the front-end developers. And I think we could do the same for designers as well. Um, someone who can do this all will maybe be a full stack designer. And I guess there are people that can do this that are highly creative, but also can do all this mathematical stuff, thinking design system stuff. But as in full stack developer, I think these people are rare and not everyone can do all of it. Most of them spe uh, are specialists in one or the other area. And there's another discourse going on that's even older uh, on the design level. And that's uh, the big question on should designers learn how to code? And I don't wanna go too much into detail here, but uh, at least I can say that uh, a lot of designers started to learn how to code. And they started this because um, in my experience, they wanted to um, actually build the stuff that they created themselves. They, they were tired of um, giving it to some black hole named uh, developer and then getting something back that is maybe not what they intended it to be. So they wanted to do it uh, themselves. And I guess most of them started not with some backend code, but they started uh, doing CSS because this is the, in my experience, most visual uh, programming language that you can have. 
Because of this, uh, the gap between design and development is getting smaller and smaller. Um, and to be honest, I think uh, it's even getting not smaller, but it's getting like this. They overlap uh, more and more. And uh, especially with uh, things like auto layout in, in Figma these days, where you can um, uh, learn how Flexbox works by applying uh, rules to your design. Or if you wanna uh, cre create some website and don't wanna write code at all, you can, maybe you're a designer using Webflow. And I'm still surprised at how good um, these things work today. So uh, all of these position, all of these uh, people here are moving closer together and uh, overlap at some point. Um, so when, when your tool set here is maybe somewhere over here, then you're exactly there somewhere where um, uh, you are in, in the middle of the discussion of are you a front of the front end developer, are you back of front end? Where are you? What's your skill set? And the same may be true if you're over here. Are you a user interface designer? Are you more of an artist? Are you an application designer? Uh, what, what's your skill set? Um, and people are talking about this. I think people are not talking about these uh, people that much because what are they? They are not a designer, not yet a developer. Who are they? Um, but people are doing this. And, and there are people out there uh, are great in exactly the gap between design and development. And um, I think because of all this overlapping, it becomes increasingly difficult to create, for example, a good job description. Because every time you include a skill that is maybe too specific, some people may not feel addressed because they think my skills are not sufficient. I'm, I'm not as good as a designer, not as good uh, as a developer here. I don't know Git, for example, but maybe I know a lot of CSS. I've done everything in CodePen. I don't know anything about Git. Am I good? Um, do I qualify for this job? I don't know. Um, so in the end, I want you to embrace the fact that all these disciplines are moving closer together and I think it would be very good if we uh, try to put up as few barriers as possible so um, that the walls between the disciplines are becoming more and more transparent and uh, everyone can learn and benefit from each other. Like, if you remember this, um, Bonaleski taught Masaccio how to do this. And in the end, he was able to uh, paint this famous fresco here. And that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much.